Hi, welcome to All Things Divorce Podcast. I'm Lonnie Sheldon, the host of All Things Divorce Podcast. Today we have Jennifer Maholovich. And actually, Jennifer, you go by Jenny, don't you? Which I did I not know. Okay. So um, she'll be on our show talking about child support and their factors. So a little bit about Jenny. She's been practicing law for about 27 years, and she had this 16-year career as a, an assistant attorney general, where she worked in child and family protection division, child support enforcement section, uh, with a base in Maricopa County, but had opportunities to touch families all over the state. So while at the attorney general's office, Jenny worked as a mentor for new attorneys, just venturing into the trial work and um, was responsible for creating, implementing, and presenting training on a wide range of topics throughout the state, including child support modifications, child support in high income cases, which is really interesting and I want to get to today also, um, and the child support issues arising from the Uniform Interstate Family Support Act. In uh, 2016, Jenny transferred to private practice, which we're all thankful for because now we get to pick her brain all the time. She's with Stewart Law Group in a full service family law firm in the Valley. Since that time, Jenny has maintained uh, her child support focus as a member of the Child Support Guidelines Review Subcommittee, charged with evaluating, revising, and updating the Arizona Child Support Guidelines and expanding her area of interest to include international child support and interstate custody issues. Uh, Jenny is a member of the Family Court um, improvement Committee from, nine, or from 2019 to 2022 and has presented trainings on child support issues for the Arizona State Bar, for the Maricopa County Bar, um, and has assisted the State Bar of Arizona as an expert in the area of ethical, represent uh, ethical representation and standard of care for clients in child support cases. Uh, so just remember, as always, the information provided in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered specific advice for your case. Both Jenny and I are only licensed to practice in Arizona, and um, the, this podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship with either me or Jenny. That being said, this podcast is available to anyone, anywhere, and we believe much of the information can be useful in all jurisdictions. Jenny, thank you so much for being here. I want to talk to you today about child support and uh, kind of the factors and the what ifs. I'm, ha I'm happy to be here, Alani. Looking forward to chatting with you. This is a uh a much wider field than people realize. They think it's easy. We have a calculator. How hard can it be? And it's actually a lot more complicated than that in, in some circumstances. It, it actually a lot of circumstances. And that's why we, we are all always calling you up and asking you questions. So <laughs> I know we all appreciate your willingness to talk to us. So uh, the topic, uh, you know, we're gonna, actually going to do two podcasts. So this is number one of the podcast. Um, so what... Uh, what if a parent is, let's kind of go in, let's, well, tell me what child support is. Let, how about that? Do the description of child support. So child support, at least in Arizona, is meant to be a funds transfer between the parents that allows one parent to contribute to the basic needs of the child when they are with the other parent. Now, basic needs People can argue about that. But generally speaking, we are talking about food, shelter, clothing. Um, now, different people will say things like, you know, cell, some judges will say cell phones included in that. I'm not going to order a, a separate payment or contribution to cell phones. Um, it doesn't include extracurricular activities that specifically separate unreimbursed medical expenses are specifically separate. And you know, food, shelter, clothing, for sure. The rest of it's kind of in the middle. Um, people sometimes think, well, we have equal custody, so I'm, I shouldn't have to pay child support. In Arizona and a lot of other jurisdictions, this is the prevailing model, is the shared income model. So in Arizona and other states that use the shared income model, the idea is that the child should be in the same position that the child would have been in if the parents had lived in an intact household. Generally, people who live in a single household put their money in the same pot, which results in them paying the bills, whether it's child related or not, 
in a pro rata basis. Um, so if mom makes $100, dad makes $100, they put it in the pot and they each pay the, the, the total community bills out of that pot. Essentially, they're each paying 50% because they've put in the same amount. But if one makes 100 and the other one makes 50, one is paying, in theory, twice as much towards the bills because they've put in twice as much into the pot. So even for people who have never lived together, um, the court is still gonna use this model because that's sort of a fundamental underlying um, assumption that, that we want to treat children as if they would have been treated if the parents lived in the same house. So if you've got one parent making a lot more money, then they may end up paying child support even though they have equal parenting time. And in very extreme cases, you could even end up with a situation where the, the primary residential parent, the parent that had more than 50% parenting time, is paying child support to the other parent who has 50% or less parenting time because of a vast difference in incomes between the households. Why is that, someone might ask? Well, the idea is that you don't necessarily want a child living in abject poverty in one household and living in a mansion in the other household. It's not meant to completely level the playing field between the parents, but it is meant to ensure that the level of care that the child receives at least approaches a consistent level. Um, and that's how come you can end up with a situation where with equal parenting time, one person is still paying the other person. Right. And, and in Arizona, what are the what are the main factors that are considered? Um, the big ones are your income, whether or not you have other children, and your parenting time. Now, there are smaller considerations, um, things that don't apply in every case, such as whether you pay or receive spousal maintenance, whether you pay health insurance, private health insurance, whether you have child care expenses, um, whether you have a child with special needs and therefore expense, special expenses. Um, those are less common circumstances. So, so I would say that the big ones are your income, your other children, your parenting time. But in this day and age, health insurance is getting to be so expensive that it, it can have a huge impact as well um, because that's a, monetar uh, a, a mandatory credit. Um, some other of the credits against your child support are permissive, meaning the court can do it, but they don't have to. Provision of health insurance is a mandatory credit. If you provide it, you have to be given credit for it. Um, and so with with the health insurance cost kind of going seven, eight, nine hundred dollars a month, that is starting to become um, sort of a more impactful um, consideration in calculating the child support. You know, and I know this isn't anything that we discussed, but what um, what if both parents have insurance? Do they are they offset? Um, it kind of depends on your judi judicial officer. I will say as an outset is sort of a preface to any answer I give today. We in Arizona have charged our family court judges with exercising what's called judicial discretion. It's kind of a term of art. You see it in our court of appeals and, and Supreme Court cases, which means that the, tri the trial level court is charged with applying a very broad set of rules, our statutes, to a very narrow and specific topic, you know, your child, my child, this child. And there's a huge gap there. There's a really big gap between what the broad statute that applies to every single child in the entire state of Arizona. And as you know, Arizona is very diverse. You know, down here in Phoenix, it's 120. And in theory, doesn't snow. Although today we might have we might have broken that stereotype. And then you've got Flagstaff that's had you know 200 inches of snow today. And you've got you know Sierra Vista and Bisbee, which are much closer to the border and have totally different considerations than say um, Luke Air Force Base, which is out on the west side of Phoenix. And so judicial discretion comes into play because you have these very broad laws that are supposed to apply to all those places and all those children equally. 
But the person facing you in the courtroom has very unique circumstances. And so that empty space between the broad law and the very specific person is where the judicial discretion comes in. And things like insurance, how do all we know is that if you provide it, you're supposed to get credit. But that is premised on the idea that one person is ordered to provide it. So in my experience, and again, there's going to be exceptions to this, especially in the the outlying, what we call the outlying counties, the less metropolitan areas. But if if you are in a post-decree situation, you're modifying your child support, you're enforcing your child support, you have an order already that says mom's supposed to provide health insurance, dad's supposed to provide health insurance, then the court's going to use whoever was provided, who was ordered okay. to provide. And, and if the other person got it just because they could, they had it at their work, it seemed like a good idea, generally they're not going to get credit too. Um, the exception would be medically fragile children, children with what would otherwise be potentially catastrophic medical expenses that you may have a situation where the court looks at it and says, you know, yeah, I'm going to add in both insurance, but this is going to have a net effect of decreasing both parties expenses over the span of a year. Um, but I would say as the general rule, it's going to be the person ordered to provide it. If you're coming into court and you haven't been to court before, um, and it is a situation where someone's historically provided it, generally the court is going to order that person to continue to provide it. So say in a marriage, dad works, mom stays at home. So dad's generally provided the insurance. They're going to order dad to continue to provide it. Um, when your case is with the state, the statute carves out an exception. And, and when I say your case is with the state, that's probably a whole nother podcast. Um, but if you have a 40 case where the state of Arizona is involved, the attorney general's office is involved, the statute actually says they're required to only designate one person. Oh, interesting. That's I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, it has to do with recoupment of expenses paid on access and things like that. Like I said, probably a topic for a whole nother podcast, um, but it doesn't apply to cases where the state's not involved. Um, but it has to do with, you know, it's a bad idea to order both parents just because of enforceability issues. Um, but um, I, I think that that if you just have someone who gratuitously adds their child on, say they get remarried and they're all going on the new spouse's insurance, so that child comes along too, the court's going to be less likely to give that secondary provider credit. Um, the other thing people should know is you can't designate which insurance to use. Um, the You can't go into court and say, well, I'm going to be primary and she's going to be secondary. The insurance industry has a standard protocol that the family court can't override um, that has to do with how when people have duplicate coverage, how that coverage applies and what the indemnification between providers is. And it has to do with who's older or whose birth date comes first. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it has nothing to do with your choice. It has nothing to do with the quality of care. You know, if, oh, my insurance is better. It has to do with a predetermined, totally unrelated to family court, um, insurance standard for how that's going to happen. So they will always know, oh, well, this child's mom is, you know, a year older than the dad. So mom's insurance is primary, dad's insurance is secondary. Um, I did once have a case where the parents were born on the same day in the same year. And honestly, I never figured out. I never found out. I asked them to call me and let me know. They never did of what the insurance company was going to do about that because there's got to be a tiebreaker rule out there somewhere. That couldn't have been the only case. But I would say the short answer, even though I gave you the long answer, is that they're going to go with whoever has had the historical um, coverage. Now, if the parties want to agree to use both and put both on the worksheet and give both parents credit, they certainly can. But maybe one of the things that people watching this don't understand is the impact of that. So in Arizona and other states that use the income shares model, there's two columns, the parent A's column and parent B's column. And if, if they have equal income, 
then it's going to all equal out in the bottom anyway. But if one pays more, you know, earns more. So say you have a 75-25 situation, one parent's earning 75% of the income and the other person's earning 25%. When you put that out-of-pocket cost for the insurance on the worksheet, doesn't matter if it's in parent A's column or parent B's column, it's going to then charge the other side their respective percentage of that cost. So if you have parent A providing health insurance and it costs $100 and they have 75% of the financial, you know, the pro rata combined share of income, it's going to add to the other parents column $25 because that's 25%. And if the 25% parent has insurance that also costs $100, it's going to add 75 over to the other side. And so it, it has an impact over and above just maybe on your out-of-pocket expenses on the worksheet itself. So when you have a parent providing secondary coverage, especially if it comes later due to remarriage or a new job or something like that, and there's other people covered where they're not paying any more than they would pay, whether the child was on it or not, the court's not likely to include it because it wasn't done specifically to provide a benefit to this child. Okay. So um, let's talk about the money because you were talking about if one parent is um, makes a hundred thousand and one parent makes 50,000, then one's paying two thirds, but how do you determine the income because, and, and I, I want to go more specific than just the W, you know, the W-2s or, you know, the taxes, because I think it's deeper than that. I think, you know, I mean, how many, there's a reason why you, you know, have work because um, people aren't always honest with their income um, and they try and, you know, like you might think that a second job shouldn't count. And I, as a lawyer might think that a second job should count. Um, so what are the, what counts as, um, as income for child support? Well, that's a really good question. And one of the things we, on our last uh, revision of the child support guidelines in Arizona, um, to some extent, we threw out the baby with the bathwater. We reformatted them. We reauthored them from start to finish. A lot of sections didn't change. We just changed how they were authored. We edited them to just read in a different, more cohesive manner. Um, but one of the changes, which wasn't meant to be a sea change, wasn't meant to be controversial, it was meant to better memorialize the status quo, was the prior guidelines prior to January 1st of 2022 just said income, gross income. And so many people tried to equate that with gross income for tax purposes. And that's not what it was ever intended to be. And if you read the old guidelines, you could you could pinpoint to examples that showed that that was not what it was intended to be. For example, it said gross income is income from any source. Well, a lot of sources like veterans disability payments are not taxable. So they're not showing up on a tax return. You're not getting a tax form like a 1099 or a W-2 or, or a 1098. And so in, in this iteration of the guidelines, when we were going to rewrite them anyway, one of the things that we thought was really important was to clarify that. And so now in the guidelines that apply now since January of 2022, they say gross income for child support purposes is not necessarily your gross income for tax purposes. And so it, they use the term child support income because it is something so much more potentially or much more expansive than what you're going to capture on a, a tax form. So like you said, it's easy if you're a W-2 employee. To some extent, it's easy if you're a 1099 employee, which is someone who's self-employed, an independent contractor, as they're commonly referred to, if that person is keeping good records. Um, you know, business records of how much money spent, you know, um, and how much money they're earning. It can be easy. It starts to go off the rails a little bit when you have complex business systems that pay people. Um, the average person doesn't think about this, but, you know, I have a client, for example, who there's an umbrella business that pays, there's subsidiary businesses that pay, and they only get one paycheck, but it's actually 
you know, at the end of the year, he gets like 12 W2 or 12 1099s. Um, and so it can be very complex, but as a basic matter, it's income from any source. And our Court of Appeals has determined that even loans are income for purposes of calculating child support. Oh, wow. which is I don't think I knew that controversial. One. <laughs> um, because you know, you have to pay a loan back. But what the Court of Appeals has said in multiple decisions is that the concern of the court is what money is available to spend on a child. So say you manage a, an apartment complex, so you get your apartment for free. You aren't spending $1,500 a month on rent. So you have $1,500 more in your pocket to spend for your child. And so they add that $1,500 in to your income. Some people get a car allowance. Some people get a cell phone allowance. Those have less impact on child support because one of the things that you have to remember is the entire worksheet, when you look at it, it may have specific numbers with little cents at the end, you know, 14 cents, 68 cents. The actual guidelines don't have cents. They're rounded whole numbers in, I think, $25 increments, $15 increments. So all those numbers you're putting on that worksheet are being rounded multiple times over. Your income's being rounded, the basic child support amount's being rounded, your health insurance is being rounded, even your percentage, because it multiplies out two digits. So, you know, 25.17, you know, we're going to, it's going to round to 25%. And so back when I was with the AG's office, I would have people call and say, well, I need to modify my child support because he got a 25 cents an hour raise. Well, it, it isn't, I mean, if it changes the child support at all, it's going to be like a dollar, <laughs> you know, because all that rounding that already happened sort of took into account those sorts of changes. Um, but you just, when you evaluate when someone tells you, this is what I have, you have to look at it through the lens of income from any source, number one, and number two, does it cause there to be money available for expenditure for the child? And if it does, it's going to be considered. When you talk about second jobs, there's a difference between someone who has two part-time jobs, a waitress that works at two different restaurants, as opposed to someone who works a 40 hour work week and then delivers DoorDash on the weekends. Um, the court has said, the guidelines now say there is no expectation that someone will work an extraordinary work regimen. And there is no argument that can be made that this is not true, that two households is more expensive than one. Um, I always tell my divorce clients, you know, even all things being equal, you're going to have a trash bill from the city. Now he's going to have a trash bill from the city. You're going to have an internet bill. He's going to have an internet bill. So while your combined mortgage may have been $3,000 and now yours is 1500 rent and he's 1500 rent, the rest of it is going to start to duplicate. And that means it's going to be more expensive. And so that just means there's going to be kind of less available. And um, that means that people go out and get second jobs or they work extra shifts or whatever to make up that shortfall. And if you were to then include that as income for child support, you'd get in this impossible chicken before the egg situation where, where people especially paying parents would never be able to catch up because every time they went to earn some more money to pay their child support, they would get dinged for more and it would just go around and around and around. But there's exceptions. What I call passive income, people who get money from stocks or other investments, rental income from other properties that they may own, um, inheritance, trust fund type things, VA disability um, one of the things with VA disability, unlike social security disability, is you can work and be 100% disabled from the VA, um, which means that you have a secondary passive income potentially along with your employment. Those are both going to be included because it doesn't cause you to work an extraordinary work regimen. You're still working 40 hours a week and you're still going to get that second check from the VA. So that's why I get a lot of questions about income because there are as many... Like sources of money that you can imagine. So every time someone thinks they have a, a novel one or a new one, I'll get a call that says, what about this? You know, 
Um, and, and I'm going to do that to you right now um, because police officers, uh, they are, you know, they're off duty stuff that they do the entire marriage. So if somebody's got their job and say it's a 40 hour week or close to a 40 hour week, and maybe even like a nurse who's like 32 hours a week. Right. Um, and then they, they do this extra, well, let, let's start, let's do the nurse. If the nurse's hours are say 32 hours and that's considered full time, right? Is that what it is? is it's it 36, 30, 36 actually. Okay. It's called a Baylor shift because they do three twelves. Right. So if, if, and that, that's not clearly, that's not a lot, but there's four hours. If they're doing something for four hours, does that count towards it? It, it's going to depend. I would say generally no, because most judicial officers are going to look at the industry standard. You really get in the weeds when you talk about pilots. Pilots and flight attendants have, unlike police who are doing that because of the convenience of their job, firefighters are another, where you have like, you know, two days on, which is 48 hours, you're in the firehouse for 48 hours, and then you get four days off. That's the convenience of your employer. That's how they set up um, they're, they're all their jobs. Now, using the Metro Phoenix area, the different fire departments within, you know, so Chandler, Gilbert, Mesa, they all use a different formula. The hotshot firefighters in Northern Arizona use a different formula, but it's, it all comes down to the same idea where you have, like you said, big blocks of time where they're off work versus a nurse the Baylor shift, the 36 hour shift is, is healthcare industry standard. So it's nurses, some, you know, it's a hospital standard, basically people who work in a hospital are going to do that. Not necessarily if you work in a doctor's office, you know, in a strip mall, right. but most judges are going to look at the industry standard, whether you're a pilot, you're a nurse, you're a police officer, what's your industry standard as the starting point. And since the industry standards for nurses are three twelves, most judges are not going to attribute income over and above that. Now, using your example of the police officer who does like security off duty or whatever, if a nurse works 312, she obviously has four days a week off. In our cases, because we are dealing with people who are no longer together by definition, most nurses will schedule their time that they work the three days when the kids are with dad. Right. And the three days. So so they can't go get another job because then that would create child care expense and it would create, you know, they're in the profession they're in so that they can have a lot of time with their children. Uh, you know, I worked at the AG's office as long as I did because of the flexibility and the benefits that benefited my children. You know, I'm sure you did the same thing during your career, made your career choices in a way that benefited your time with your children. And so the court isn't going to punish someone, a nurse, a doctor, you know, a physical therapist who works in a hospital and say, I'm going to charge you income for these days when the kids are with you. Um, because within the industry, 36 hours is considered full time. You get into really sticky territory with pilots and um, flight attendants because the federal law dictates how much they can work, when they can work, how much time off they are required to have between shifts. And so most judicial officers are loath to wade into that pool. Because there's a reason a pilot has to have so much time off between flights. <laughs> we as passengers <laughs> don't want, you know, our pilot to be exhausted. And so to say, oh, you should get a second job because you're only flying 16 hours this month or whatever. Um, the court is going to look, I think, in most of the airline type cases is, again, what's the industry standard? And the reason that that can get sticky is because then the next layer down from industry standard is airline standard. So the uh, budget airlines, <laughs> they don't have a union. They don't have the same sort of bargaining power and the same sort of contracts with their pilots as, say, United, Delta, Southwest, so you may have a pilot that works for United that has a very specific contract that says the pilots are going to get paid this based on their pay grade because there's captains, there's co-captains, there's navigator. Um, it's not called navigator. That's what I call it. It has an official name. <laughs> Maybe that makes it, I don't mean to cheapen their job, but that's what I think of it as, the navigator. Um, 
and on big flights with big planes when you have when you have three members of the cockpit. Um, and that contract may further limit the industry standard. So the industry standard may say you can fly, you know, 30 hours in a month, but their particular contract with their particular carrier can say, well, no, the, our, our pilots are not going to fly any more than 20 hours. And in those cases, the court's really going to look at their income. I mean, a captain that flies for a major airline is making $400,000, $450,000 a year. So you're not going to attribute them more income because you're right. already over the statutory maximum for child support, which is another topic, which is $30,000 a month. So when you start to get into those high income cases, you're less likely to get attributed income because you have more than enough income with the job that you have. But mid-level, to your point, um, police officers, um, they don't have federal or state law that dictate how they can work. They're working at the convenience of their employer, you know, a 12-hour shift, three days a week or whatever. Um, and so they do. They do a lot of security work. They supervise exchanges for our family court cases. Um, and I think the court would look at in a divorce situation or even in a case where it's just a relationship they've never been married at what that person has done historically. Because I think you make a really good point that the person who's always done this, it's not they're taking on an extraordinary work regimen. They may have always had an extraordinary work regimen, but you still have to be careful because being in a even a cohabitation relationship, even a non-marital but cohabitation relationship may have been what allowed that person to work that much. Because I know from my own experience, finding childcare evenings, overnights, weekends is very difficult. And for police officers using that as an example, security work is usually nights and weekends. And if that's the time, if, if the person had during the whole marriage worked, you know, security on the weekends, whatever, and brought extra money into the household, it may be that they can't do that anymore now that um, they're going to have their kids half the time or they're going to have their kids on weekends or they just can't find child care, someone to stay until 11 o'clock at night or two in the morning or or whatever. Um, I had a, a client that had a nanny that drove his child to school because he lived very far from the child's school. And he had to find someone to come to work at five in the morning. And it was very difficult to find a nanny that wanted to come to work at five in the morning. Um, and he was constantly cycling through people because he'd hire them and they'd do it for a little while. And then they'd get sick of getting up at five in the morning or they'd be late a lot or whatever. Um, so those are going to be considerations that the court's going to look at in trying to to craft a dollar amount um, in child support. And they may work backwards. The court may look at it and say, what kind of difference is this making in the end result of the child support? Um, and is it necessary to make that adjustment? You know, do we need to add that in? Does the child need that extra money or, or can whatever the base child support amount is with base, base income? Is that enough to support this child? And I, th I think, I, and I love that you said that because that goes right back to the discretion of the court and don't piss off your judge, right? Um, mm -hmm. Right? So the, the court does have discretion over things like that and a lot of it. Um, and something I was also going to mention is, is by the way you're talking about that, it is not unusual then for, you know, you, when, when people are married, they often have the breadwinner and the childcare person. Um, and now the childcare person has to become a breadwinner and the breadwinner has to become the childcare person um, during their time. So they're both going to take on both jobs during their time. So it's the court doesn't necessarily then frown on. Now, let, let me back up. You're not allowed to just dump your income because now you're staying at home or now you've got your child. But the court doesn't necessarily frown on on people either changing a little bit one way or another to um, to so that they can stay home with their kids, so that they can have the parenting time. Would you agree with that? Is that I would agree with that. And I think what one of the things people often don't think about or they don't frame it this way when I talk to them, I, I, I see that they're not framing it this way is we don't have involuntary servitude <laughs> anymore. So say you were a housewife and now there's talk of attributing you income. 
you don't actually have to go out and get a job. <laughs> no, no one is going to make you go get a job. We're just saying for purposes of calculating the other person's child support, your life choice is not going to be financially borne by them now that you're no longer in a relationship. So, you know, I, I have people say that to me all the time. He's going to make me get a job. Well, no one can make you get a job. It's whether or not the court is going to say as a placeholder, we're going to put this dollar amount in here for purposes of calculating child support. And I have a really good example of that. A number of years ago, I did a case where um, the mom had worked for many, many, many years as a dental hygienist, and she worked in some very specialized fields. So she made quite a bit of money, $75,000, $85,000 a year. And she had grown to hate it. She she would, didn't want her hands in people's mouths. She didn't want people breathing on her at two inches away. She was just very disenchanted with her job. So she left uh, well, at night, weekends, whatever. She went back to school and got like a master's in fine art or something and then quit her job, got a job at an art gallery in Scottsdale as some sort of art, per, you know, sales art gallery manager, and then filed to modify her child support because now it was commission only. So until somebody bought a painting, she wasn't going to make any money. And she wanted her child support to go up exponentially because now she wasn't making $85,000 a year. And the court said, I hear what you're saying. I wouldn't want someone breathing all over me all day long either. But your life choice to become an art gallery manager is not a life choice that dad is going to subsidize via child support. So you go be a gallery manager. Godspeed, make a ton of money. Life is grand. But for child support, we're going to use the income that you would be making as a hygienist. And she had just left, so there wasn't a lot of controversy about what her income as a hygienist was, but so the child support stayed the same. And so there, there is circumstances where the court is going to attribute someone a change in income and others where they're not, because you, you do have to look bigger picture. You do have to look sort of more macro level. I also had a case I did right at the beginning of my career. So in the early 2000s of a guy who the husband was a cameraman for Channel 3. And Channel 3 went to all computerized cameras. There were going to be no people behind the cameras. So he was let go. The job doesn't exist anymore. He couldn't go get another job as a cameraman. Now he could have gone back to school to learn how to operate the motherboard that controlled the computers that controlled the cameras, but that would have taken quite a bit of time. I had another case of a woman who lost her job at the Palo Verde nuclear power plant because of employee misconduct. So it was, it was actually her fault. The next closest nuclear power plant is in Northern California. She couldn't get another job because there's only one nuclear power plant in Arizona and they fired her. And so, again, in that case, the court didn't lower or didn't change the child support. They attributed her her income because it was employee misconduct um, that got her fired. Um, but those kind of considerations, is your job so unique? Is your employer so unique that you couldn't get a job? Is it because you played a role in your own demise? Or was it voluntary? Was it for health reasons? Um, those will all come into play. Um, and, and I'm going to use this as an opportunity to plug mediation after you hire an attorney. Um, again, probably a podcast for another day. The reasons you don't do mediations with an attorney, without an attorney before you even file for divorce. Um, but these things are so judge specific. And quite frankly, it could be day of the week specific. I've had judges rule one way in one case, and then I'm all confident when I go in the next time with similar facts that I know how they're going to rule and they do something totally different. So I'm sure you've had that happen as well. Yes, um, definitely. Sometimes it's personal growth. They've just changed how they, you know, other times it's just they don't have a predictable um, personality. And so mediation on all these issues, because 
our, our child support is on an Excel spreadsheet. You can run those numbers in two seconds, change it. You know, if we attribute him this, what happens to the child support? If we attribute her this, what happens to the child support? And in a mediation, you can run through those numbers and you can see, is this worth fighting about? Is his 25 cent an hour raise worth fighting about? And if not, move on. You can't do those kind of like micro level experiments in a trial setting. You pick your lane and you're stuck in it. Even if you decide halfway to, through the trial, like, oh shoot, maybe that wasn't the best position. You know, you're stuck. It, it's interesting that you say that when I, when we had the, um, recently we had the the judges talking, um, I think I, the, the speed dating, we call it where you get to ask judges questions. Um, one of them said, I want to see 10 different um, child support worksheets. If, if this, then that. And I, I was a little surprised. I've always done a couple, you know, um, but you don't typically, just like you said, run through everything because no matter what, when you're in trial, you know, a number can change by $5 here, $10 there, $100 there, $10,000 here. You're not going to be able to run um, every single scenario like you can in a mediation where you can just have the mediator go, okay, run that, run that. I'm sitting here, I'm right. looking at that. What is this? And when you end up with a, say, a like a, you know, a $50 difference, it's like, all right, let's split the difference and move on. Right. I mean, that's right. really what I think it ends up up with. Um, so I wanted to talk to you also about um, if you need more support and I, and we, we had talked about doing more or less, but I'd like to focus on more. Let's say let's say you need more support for the child than what the, um, the guidelines are saying you should have. What, what do you do then? Well, that's a deviate, an upward deviation. And it comes down to, and, and the, the biggest shortcoming and where people fail the most is being able to show their work. Um, and I always tell my clients, if I had to do an affidavit of financial information, I wouldn't be able to do it. I don't know how much I spend on coffee every month. I don't know how much I spend on laundry detergent. That's one of the questions, laundry. Um, and so I feel their pain when they're asked to fill out this affidavit of financial information. I, I, I've often thought about like during COVID when we had some lulls, I was like, I should try to fill out an AFI and see what it's like, because I look at them every day and I just think I would never, I would never, I could fill in my mortgage amount, you know, maybe my car insurance, but like most of that stuff, I just, I don't know. I, the bills get paid every month and you don't know. And that's really where people fall down who need more because you have to show your work. You have to show, you know, say the child support comes out to $500 and, and you have the child, you know, three quarters of the time. You have to show where it is that that shortfall is happening or why that shortfall is happening. I'll give you an example. I had a client who had a child that had a disorder, disease, a, a diagnosis of something. I don't even remember what it was, but one of the traits of this dis disorder was chewing on their shirt. So, so this child would literally chew on the front collars of their shirt all day, every day. So this mom would go to like Costco and buy like the 10 pack of men's undershirts. And I mean, she was going through undershirts, you know, like paper cut, like uh, other people go through paper cups because the kid could only wear these shirts, you know, maybe two, maybe three times before the hole in the collar and he chewed the hole. And it was, it was a, a symptom of a diagnosed condition that he had. He was disabled. And it was very easy to show those receipts of how often, you know, photographs of what the shirt looks like on him, not even just on the table, because then someone's going to say, oh, you did that to the shirt. The shirt, you know, he doesn't really do that. It doesn't really look like that. But wearing them with big holes in the neck where he chewed on them. And she was very readily able to be able to show where she was spending that money. Food sensitivities is a big one probably one close to your heart. <laughs> it's very expensive to eat healthy, whole, unadulterated food, unprocessed food. And 
keeping those receipts. It's a pain in the butt. And I tell my clients who have this, I understand I'm asking you to take an extra step in what already is an extra step, you know, having to drive to specialty food restaurants or places. But you know what? Pay for your kids' food separate. You know, it's a pain in the butt. You got to put the divider. You got to do it. You know, the, the child with the food sensitivity, pay for their separate. So you, you have this receipt that we don't have to go through and draw like a little map all over to figure out, okay, well, the Snicker bar wasn't theirs, but, you know, the organic apples were. Um, because showing your work is what's really important in those upward deviations. Now, there's extreme cases. Um, Steve Nash, who most sporty people will recognize the name. He was a Phoenix Sun. He was, you know, sort of a, a giant in the game, not just an average NBA player. His divorce is one of the leading cases in high income earner cases. But one of the, the number one thing that comes up in high earner cases is de upward deviations. And in his case, his ex-wife had crazy expenses that people don't have security for her children. So they did not get kidnapped or, you know, otherwise, <laughs> you know, offended because people, her husband was still playing for the sons at the time. People were happy. People were sad. You know, people are, there's some unstable people out there in the world. Um, you know, the type of place she could live in had to be secured. It had to have security. It couldn't just be a house in a neighborhood that anyone could just drive by. And the court accepted these expenses to dem because of this unique need of their their circumstances their family and so she was able to show her work so whether you're ultra rich and you have these needs or whether you're just barely have two nickels to rub together but you have a child with a gluten allergy or you know a, a shellfish allergy or whatever and you have to buy certain things the case presentation is the same. It's show your work. Where is that money? Because if if more of your money is being diverted to those things, those basic needs, food, shelter, clothing, you might need extra money for. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's the Nash case was very interesting. I was, um, I'll just say, I know the people who worked on that case. Um, and so it was, it was a very interesting case. Um, with a judge that is no longer on the bench. Um, so, okay, so I think we've got a really good handle on the child support. Um, and I know it, we're, we don't wanna talk about modification now because we're gonna talk about that on another podcast. Um, but I also wanna talk about, you know, when you're talking about you don't get enough support, you don't, um, or you get too much. There, there is something that we used to do quite frequently when parents made about the same amount of money and they had about the same amount of parenting time is where we would, if it was just a negligible amount, what is, and, and I think at least in Arizona, you have to show, you have to provide a child support worksheet to the court. Um, and then if you want to deviate at all, you have to state if you're going to agree. Um, and again, if you're not going to agree agree you have to state why it's in the best interest of the children or that it is in the best interest of the children because whatever um so do you see that a lot do you see a lot where that people just say look we're just both going to waive child support and then if you do what do you file with that so you're right when i first started doing this in 2000 it was if if you just decided like hey i don't want child support you would just write that in in the order and the court didn't really care that there wasn't a worksheet attached. I mean, some people attached it, some didn't, you know, it, it wasn't anything that raised a red flag to anyone. Many, many years later, I would say probably around 2010, 2011, there had just been a ton of cases where people came back later and said, well, I didn't know I was waiving a thousand dollars a month. I thought I was waiving a hundred dollars or, you know, whatever. And it just became quite problematic. And so I was at the attorney general's office at the time. Um, we used to, we don't so much any, or they don't so much anymore. We did a lot more working cooperatively with the court to come up with, because we appear so frequently. Like when I was there, I would have anywhere from 450 to 650 active cases. You know, I would do 35 hearings to 50 hearings a week just in one day, let alone if I covered for someone else on another day. And so we would work very cooperatively with the court so that 
we could streamline, we could make that happen. We needed to be on the same page. What were the judges looking for? What did they need us to give them? Um, it wasn't like collusion in terms of an, any one particular result. It was just, this is what I need in my courtroom to prove these facts. This is how we're going to do it. And we came together and said, look, we're seeing a lot of problems on our side at the attorney general's office of people complaining that they didn't know what they were waiving in Arizona to make a waiver. It has to be knowing intelligently and voluntarily made. We're, we're worried that it's not knowing intelligent or voluntarily made if nobody's running a worksheet. The court said, we're having the same problem over here. So it was just kind of a change in perspective. It wasn't like a pronounced rule change, like, oh, you're going to always include a worksheet. It was just an, an expectation change. So people would turn in agreements to do no child support with no worksheet and they'd get it sent back from the court that says sorry you got to attach a worksheet and it was just a slow very slow turning of the tide that now 23 years you know well 12 years after that it's an expectation if if you're going to waive it if you're going to say zero you have to include a worksheet i have a couple ways i do it one is what i call de minimis rounding um the guidelines had said $10 or less is not considered a deviation. So it allowed people like me who have OCD that the number has to end in a zero or a five <laughs> to make the number end in a zero or a five without calling it a deviation. Um, but um, I will, and I have not gotten any feedback in the negative from the judges. If it's, tw you know, the clearinghouse fee is $8. So if the child supports $20, we're not going to you know, do a $20, pay an $8 fee to make a $20 payment. And so what I have done is write on the worksheet zero, you know, de minimis rounding to zero. And in my order, it said the parties stipulate from $20 to zero as de minimis rounding. So we don't have to go through the findings of why, you know, you could, you could type it in there. It's just quicker and easier. And I, I maybe in some passive aggressive way, I'm trying to make a point that we should have had a, a bottom of the barrel, we should have said, if it's less than this, it's just going to be zero, right. you know, because um, nobody's paying $8 to pay $8. You know what I mean? Um, but what you're talking about, I think, is something that we talked about extensively um, on the Child Support Guidelines Committee, which was, again, going back to mediation, you don't want to spend a dollar to make a dime. You don't want to spend $10,000 in attorney's fees to go to trial to get an extra 10 bucks a month in child support. It will never pay dividends. It will never be. And so we really wanted people, we, we wanted to encourage people to negotiate, to come up. They know their kids best. Come up with a number. So very frequently what we do in mediation is we attach two worksheets. We say, Mom's positions contained in worksheet one, dad's positions are contained in worksheet two, but for the purposes of amicable resolution, we're going to agree to the average of those two numbers. You know, mom wants 200, dad wants 300. So we're going to agree to 250 a month without prejudice to either party and future modifications. And that way, nobody's you know, sticking their, you know, flagpole in the sand and saying, I'm not moving from this amount for childcare. I'm not moving from this amount for income. And instead, we're just saying, look, really what matters is that the kids get enough money to, to live a happy and healthy life. And we don't need the worksheet to tell us what that number is. We'll, we'll use the worksheets to set a high and a low, and we'll, we'll pick a number in between. And generally, I don't call that a deviation because I mean, it, it is technically a deviation, right. but we just use language that says for the purposes of amicable resolution, this is what we're negotiating. And again, I haven't had anything but, but you know, acceptance by the court. They're just happy that people are agreeing and they're happy that we are creating a record that can be used later in modifications. Because the other problem with doing it the way we used to do it and not attaching a worksheet is the minute someone files a mod, with the starting point for a modification, which we're gonna talk about later, but the starting point for a modification is where did you leave off from the last order? Right. And if you don't have a worksheet, you have no idea 
you know, and one party will say, well, this was what was said. And the other person will say, no, this is what was said. And you as the attorney who wasn't there are like, well, I don't know what was said. Or even if you were there, you might not remember because it was five years ago or 10 years ago. So um, it's important to have those worksheets, even if you're going, going to do a different dollar amount. Now, there's the third scenario, which is a true deviation where the worksheet, everybody agrees on the worksheet. There's only one worksheet. The worksheet comes out to $500, but the parties for whatever reason are going to agree on a different number, a higher number. You know, you're, I'm going to pay a thousand instead of 500. I could give you a list of reasons why I think that happens. Um, I always tell my clients to put in the order why you're doing it, but they don't always want to for one reason or another. Um, but that's like a true deviation where you're only going to have one worksheet and you need to say it would have been this. Instead, we're green on this. And this is upward deviation. No judge is going to reject. Right. Um, you have to say why it's in the child's best interest, no matter how obvious it seems that, the child, you know, getting right. more money helps. Yeah, I always like to get my clients to be very, very specific especially if my client's the one that, that's getting, that, that's paying more, right? Because you want to be able to change that in case something happens. Right, right. Well, I, I appreciate you being here and talking about this. Um, I think it's uh, really useful and I think it's an important area. So thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to say? No, no, it was great. It was great talking to you. And um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, they're welcome to reach out. Yeah, and, and I will, um, as I, I, I should have said this earlier, I will put um, Jenny's information down below, uh, her website, her email address, in case you want to get a hold of her. Uh, she's very helpful um, and is really great um, in this area and really all areas of family law. So thank you, Jenny, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks, Lonnie. Hi, welcome to the All Things Divorce podcast. I'm Lonnie Sheldon, the host of All Things Divorce podcast. Today we have Jennifer Mihaljevic on our show and we'll be talking about the child support. Um, hold on, I'm going to read, I'm going to, I'm going to stop.